all right. We just have to put up with it, all right? So my apologies there. Uh, let's see here. I want to do some recording. I guess I am recording. Wait, hold on. I'm recording now, and my name is Renee Hobbs, and today's date is March 30th, 2017. I'm here with the amazing students of COM 416. We are in like week nine, I think, of the nine or 10 of the semester. Um, as we steam into the last part of um, the last month of class. Um, but uh, students have just finished an amazing wild ride that we like to call Leap Three, right? Where students leaped between the past and the present and they used the power of collaboration to ignite their creativity. So I'm dying to hear what your highlights and lowlights were of your Leap 3 experience. What did you love about Leap 3 and what drove you totally crazy? Who wants to go first? Yeah, Nicole. Um, I liked using, um, creating the infographic. I thought that was fun and it was the website I had never used. So it took a little bit of time to try to figure it out and I watched some videos, um, but I thought it was interesting and it's something I've never done. So I liked doing that. Were you proud of the infographic that you were able to create? Yeah. Cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Other highlights and lowlights of Leap 3. Nikita? Um, so I honestly thought I was maybe wouldn't like it because I thought it would be really hard to collaborate online. I've never actually done that. Usually if I'm doing a group project, it's in person. Um, but I don't know, it was really cool to sort of watch the paper sort of develop on the Google Doc. Um, and I also really love the infographic too. That was really cool. I'll probably use it in the future. Wow, cool. Glad to hear it. You know, I do find that collaborative writing is something that you can get all freaked out about because it is sort of like, how does it happen? But it is funny when you see it actually, like you, I like the way you describe it. It's sort of like you start with a little, but then they write, you write, and stuff. It just, it's magic. Hey, how are you, Lewis? Hi, Lewis. I see the five-year-old that I, I, I see my five-year-old. My five-year-old grandson is waving to me. <laughs> oh, I feel so happy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Hanya, and that made my day. That, that was wonderful. So give him a big kiss for me. All right, uh, so we're talking about highlights and lowlights of the Leap 3 experience. So I'd love to hear from Kaylin and Mira and Dre. What did you love and hate about Leap 3, collaborating with somebody to make an academic paper and an infographic? What did you love about doing it and what drove you crazy? I lucked out. I think um, Matt and I are actually in a another class together um, an on campus one. I am generally not a, like kind of a, like Nikita was saying, I'm not a big fan of like the online uh, collaboration. I've had kind of rough experiences in the past, but Matt and I have worked out really well. He's got more of a niche for um, design. And, and so we, we really balance each other out. I, however, remain unimpressed with Google Docs. It still frustrates the hell out of me, but, um, <laughs> but it is, it's, an, it's a good tool, but it's, 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 I'll never, I, don't, I not my thing. I, I formatting and all that. It's not fun for that. But net net, it's a good tool. Um, and like I said, Matt really took charge with the infographic, and it came out really good. So I am really glad you are describing that because Google Docs drives me crazy. <laughs> it sucks. It's yeah. So annoying. It's so annoying for formatting. It's so clunky, yeah. clunky, and so you know, yeah. It okay. serves a purpose, but. <laughs> Yep, but it's not all that much fun. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I'm I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to uh, reading your leap three, and um, I I just want to show you where I'm starting to collect them. Right. So here we are. I, I give me a thumbs up if you can actually see my screen. Can you see my screen right now? Okay, cool. So our our topic this week is fake news demagoguery and the alt right. And down at the bottom, sort of in between this post and the last one, I've stuck the Leap 3 collaborates, the ones I've been able to find. For those of you who have tweeted me a link, I'm really uh, grateful. I'm hoping to collect all of those tonight or at the very latest tomorrow. 
uh, Taylor and Kalen compared and contrasted representations of female labor by looking at the Rosie the Riveter campaign in the 1940s and the Keep the campaign of the 21st century. Uh, Alyssa and Stephanie compared and contrasted positive and negative representation of women uh, in the propaganda. Uh, Nicole and Francesca looked at women's social roles in propaganda. Uh, Shannon and Hassan looked at formation and fight the power as they looked at protest music as propaganda. So, uh, and that's just and that's just a, a that's just the tip of the iceberg because with the 25 students in this class, there, there's going to be another seven or eight more coming in the next uh, day or so. So um, that's where you're going to find them and. Um, that just links to uh, a page that has the has the infographic and the uh, academic paper. Um, all right, so we've we've kind of a little bit reflected on some of the some of the, the creative phenomenon at work when we um, enter into a collaborative partnership. Um, I was really pleased to see your work on the Padlet wall uh, this week. And um, again, I see really good evidence that you are identifying key ideas and making skillful use of visual imagery here. Um, and um, Hassan, uh, Martin, I, the, the prize of the night for, for the, the Padlet wall uh, goes to Hassan for uh, a topic that we're going to exploring a topic that's in Welsh that we're going to talk about even more next week around um, the professionalization of the military communications, creating a whole new avenue for propaganda. Um, that could be a course in itself, actually, right? I mean, you could do 12 weeks on that topic, and I feel like um, this, he points out Welsh's argument that, you know, some people thought, saw that military communicators as creating problems rather than solving them um, and there's a lot of interesting stories about the mistakes that were made in terms of propaganda efforts I and mean, there were some successes of course but there were mistakes as well um, so I was really pleased with the um, good choices of quotes and the interesting choices of pictures that you uh, use for the tablet wall. Um, okay, so I also had a chance to take a look at the um, uh, digital annotations that you made using Kami and um, the Twitter posts that you made. And I started to collect some of the most interesting Twitter posts you know, the word I, I hyperlinked there is concision. And in my 30 years as a media professional and as a scholar and as a teacher and an activist, um, I've definitely seen how the ability to use concision um, is really prized in the workplace. People who can express ideas with concision concisely, you know, in 140 characters, um, have social power that other people lack, right? So, um, so what I just did was I in I let's just see if I can I can view and publicize this the right way. Okay, what I did was I really basically highlighted. I should probably notify the people I quoted. There you go. I've just notified you. <laughs> I notified you, and I wanted to share a little bit about. Um, some of the ideas that I thought were great. Alyssa started off by acknowledging that Facebook is a gigantic source of news and information. We learned that from the readings. Uh, Nicole talked about the more that we rely on digital media, the more susceptible we are to the negative uh, impacts. Um, Maddie basically says uh, fake news, if you're a Facebook user, you're gonna get exposed to fake news. Um, and um, Aaron uh, found the term used in the readings this week called uh, enclave extremism, right? Which is a really interesting phrase for talking about the kind of um, crazy filter bubbles, the echo chambers that get um, exaggerated 
uh, through this media. And, and Hassan's excellent quote, what if there was a way that publishers didn't benefit from fake news, reminding us uh -oh. that the articles do about the economic context in which fake news occurs. Um, and then that topic of what is a demagogue and how does it defined and is Trump a de demagogue? And the more important question, what are the benefits as well as the drawbacks of demagoguery? Because demagoguery has some social functions that could be good for democracy, but may also be harmful for democracy. So Nicole pointed out that a demagogue weakens the establishment. Now, that, that may be a good thing sometimes, and sometimes that may be harmful. Um, but she also noted that demagogues sometimes turn people against each other. And again, that may also have um, positive or negative consequences, depending on the context. Um, so turning people against each other, a lot of people recognize that. Uh, Nikita loved uh, your quote about this idea that uh, demagoguery was defined in ancient times as um, a type of bullying that converted charisma into influence, right? That's just a beautiful uh, way to capture the form of social power that demagoguery represents. Um, and uh, Dina used an absolutely stunning visual along with this tweet um, to, to explain how lots of widespread misinformation increases uh, polarization, right? And um, that visual is absolutely, uh, uh, it's riveting as far as attention getting. Um, and uh, Nikita, I loved this other quote that you used, uh, very concise and beautifully written. Um, this idea that maybe the folks on the, the, the authors this week told us that maybe the folks on the alt-right are kind of like experimenting with how far they can go. How racist can they be? How outrageous can they be? How many lies can they tell, right? So uh, what, are, what were people dumb enough to believe, right? As some of you tweeted, Sandy Hook? They thought the Sandy Hook massacre of the kids in the school was a hoax? Like, you know, who could believe it, right? Um, I found this really interesting article this week when I was from my Twitter network um, about a researcher who started to actually use data analytics to unpack the conspiracy theorists, the sort of the rise of conspiracy theorists. Um, and her conclusion is really that conspiracy websites have a common ideological thread in a fear of globalization. And I think that's a really interesting idea. Next week, as we talk about terrorism, we are gonna get to unpack that a little bit more. Um, but in general, I was really pleased with the quality of your tweeting um, and the quality of the active reading strategies that I saw you demonstrating through Cami. You, you definitely engaged with these readings and that was really great. Um, okay, so now there's one reading that most of you didn't read and so I wanted to unpack it a little bit tonight and I thought the best way to do that might be through video. So how about if we break up into two teams and one team will watch the CNN ACORN scandal, and the other team will watch the, the Shirley Sherrod video, and then we'll try to figure out um, what do these stories have to do with fake news, demagoguery, and the alt-right. Okay, so we're gonna uh, break into two teams. Hold on here, I'm gonna break you into two teams right now. Assign eight participants into two rooms. Here's the way it'll work. Um, Dre, Mira, Matt, and Nikita, you guys are breakout room one. And Kaylin, Nicole, Zoe, and uh, Hong Yen, you are breakout room two. So team one, is going to is going to view it's a just a six minute video the CNN 
2010 ACORN scandal. And team two is going to view the Shirley Sherrod uh, video. Also, it's about six minutes. What we're gonna do is as you're watching, you're paying attention to try to figure out what, what is this video about and how does it relate to the topic we're talking about, fake news, demagoguery, and the alt-right. So give me a thumbs up if you're clear on our activity. We're, we've been doing this all semester, so I think you guys are comfortable with it. I'm opening up the rooms. Uh, it's gonna take, oh, here's the thing. I'm gonna close all the rooms, Never mind. Let's watch the videos first, and then I open up the rooms. That kind of makes sense, right? So again, uh, Dre, Mira, Matt, and Nikita, you guys are watching the CNN video. Kaylin, Nicole, Zoe, and Hong Yan, you're watching the Shirley Sherrod video. We'll take six minutes to view those videos, then I'll open up the breakout rooms. So stay tuned. Mute your microphone while you watch, okay? And it continues to block local municipalities from passing its own modernization law issued until 2020. How is this sooner than 2020? I really do. So while these additional protections may be temporarily delayed, they will not be forever denied. But Special Democrats and LGBT advocates said those provisions need to new legislation to simply appear to be made permanent. Can you take me through the steps of the vote in 2020, keeping most of the office matters that someone else has been dealing with? This isn't about the strength of the cast of vote. This isn't about the technique you do. It has neither of those things. Instead, they argue, it's designed to appease organizations who boycott North Carolina, the backbone of the LGBT community. Today, a vote comes after the NCAA threatened to pull people out of sports teams in the state through the year 2022 if it did not change the law. The NCAA has I work with people everywhere, on sea, on land, and in the air, inspecting towers and way up high, avoiding turbulence in the sky, personalizing treatments. In 2009, conservative blogger Andrew Breitbart made his first big splash. It was then he and American conservative activists publicized a series of undercover stings against the federal housing group ACORN, a housing initiative that had publicly supported candidate Obama's campaign. Breitbart posted videos of the stings on his website, biggovernment.com. ACORN staffers were seen offering to set up a brothel for underage prostitutes. The videos went viral and a conservative star was born. We're talking about a
Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're done watching that video. Shirley Sherrod is with us now in New York, her first live interview okay, since getting a new show. job offer so, from Secretary Vilsack. Uh, Ms. Sherrod, what did you think, first of all? Okay, so here's what, uh, here's what you're going to have to do. When you get into your small groups, the first thing you're going to have to do is see if you can summarize. So before you have any opinions about this shit, right, see if you can summarize what the heck is this all about? Who, what, where, when, why, right? Then, as a group, see if you can work out three or four ideas. What does this story have to do with fake news, demagoguery, and the alt-right? Okay? See if, you, see if you can work on that as a team. What we're going to do is ha come back and kind of compare and contrast these two stories. Right? All right. Ready to go? Here the breakout rooms are breaking, and we'll take about uh, seven minutes to do this. So the rooms are open. In 2009, conservative blogger Andrew Breitbart made his first big splash. It was then he and a pair of conservative activists publicized a series of undercover stings against the federal housing group ACORN, a housing initiative that had publicly supported candidate Obama's campaign. Breitbart posted videos of the stings on his website, biggovernment.com. ACORN staffers were seen offering to set up a brothel for underage prostitutes. The videos went viral, and a conservative star was born. We're talking about a guy who frankly has an agenda, who, who is not that concerned about context or facts. There were questions about the legality of the videos and whether they had been selectively edited to make Acorn look bad. Sound familiar? But it didn't matter. Breitbart got results. Acorn lost its federal funding and collapsed as a national organization. Eric Bollerg from the progressive watchdog group Media Matters for America calls Breitbart a misinformation <laughs> czar. A propagandist and a bit of a charlatan, and as we've seen this week, uh, sort of a character assassin. I mean, he likes to pretend he's doing journalism, but there's nothing he's doing that's remotely close to journalism. He, he knowingly publishes false information, never posts corrections, doesn't retract. Uh, it's really, he's really a one-man wrecking ball. We called Breitbart to get his take. Do you consider yourself a propagandist and do you have an agenda? Somebody has to stand up to this type of bullyism that happens in the press. The journalism is corrupt and I'm out there to the best of my abilities and with my conscience trying to right the wrong. But the Acorn and Shirley Sherrod incidents aren't the only times Breitbart's pumped out misleading information. In 2009, he posted videotape of community organizers praying. He said to then President elect Obama. He later conceded, after posting more of the tape, they might be praying to God. Breitbart has built up a small empire of websites Breitbart.com, Big Government, Big Journalism, Big Hollywood, and so on. Hits against the left translate directly to hits online. According to Breitbart.com, he serves up more than 20 million news page views each month to about 3 million unique visitors. We're talking about someone who understands our addiction to powerful video, salacious video, uh, audio taken out of context that says something dramatic. We take it, we use it, he loves it, he gets more attention, he understands what our hot buttons are. That makes Breitbart a star on the conservative conference circuit. In the last year, he's spoken at at least six Tea Party rallies and two big mainstream conservative conferences. I love confrontation, by the way. And by the way, by the way, by the way, you should too, because it's the only way we're going to win. Seems the more controversial he gets, the faster his profile and profits grow. He got a half million dollar advance for his upcoming book and says his websites are fully funded by advertisers. He admits the reaction to how he handled the Shirley Sherrod tape has been mixed, but don't expect a mea culpa from him. Do you plan to apologize to Mrs. Sherrod or no? What would warrant an apology? 
I'm asking you. Why did I even ask for an investigation of her? I'm not the one that threw her under the bus. It was the Obama administration and the NAACP, which was in possession, according to itself, of the full video. Matt is venturing to his laptop from his phone. We went on a little ride, um, but so he said he'll be right back. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, we're waiting for everybody to come back. Looks like most people are coming back. So, good, everybody's mostly back. Not quite everybody, but yeah, we're almost all back. Okay, so um, there we go. I see almost everybody is back. Okay, so um, so let's let's do this. Let's start by summarizing these two cases. What we want to do is try to see if we can just in the next like ten minutes or so see if we can figure out what is the connection between these two cases and how are they different, right? We've got the first case from 2009. I mean, you guys were how old in 2009? 
I was out of high school, so. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. Some of us are Who was the youngest person at, in our team tonight in 2009? Who was 10? No one can be 10. <laughs> okay, well, how, who's the youngest person? Would you guess? I think it's Dre. Right? I was like 14. You were 14. <laughs> Yeah, I was like a freshman in high school. All right. Yeah. Younger than 14? All right. So here we have these old, old stories from back when you were freshmen in high school. The Acorn story in 2009 and the Shirley Sherrod story in 2007. Can you guys give us the who, what, where, when, and why story on the Acorn and talk to us a little bit, a bit about how fake news, demagoguery, and the alt-right factor into it? Dre, Mira, Matt, or Nikita? We kind of look at it um, in a, look at sort of how we would view it now versus like knowing what we know now and, and the knowledge that we've sort of, that we've gained from this course. And in a, to you know, summarize it in not, in not so elegant fashion, we, sort of took the stance that it's just another phase of the taunting of back and forth and just like it's become par for the course now because like, I remember when that when that came out and I was kind of the way watching it again now versus then it was just wildly different I kind of didn't really think twice about it but we we looked at it as um it basically I think Nikita phrased it really well was uh going as you know, shamelessly sort of um exploiting any avenue just to make a point whether it's factually based or not and um when it ties into government especially at a you know when you get into the president elect stuff it it, it gets a little concerning but it's a, it's a trend that i guess has been going on a lot longer than than i realized so aha it's a trend going on a lot longer than you realize the idea of manipulating information in order to make a point but I need somebody, that was a good start, good start, Mira, but, but because you, you jumped right to analysis, but there are some of oh. us at the, in the room tonight that we didn't see the video. So first we need the who, what, where, when, and why, because remember we each only watched one or the other. Yeah, my bad, sorry. <laughs> cool. so, what, so what was that, what is the CNN story about with Acorn? What's the, what's the facts that were presented in this video? I've been yapping. Nikita, do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I feel bad. Um, so basically, ACORN is this like federal housing organization, and they had publicly endorsed Obama. And um, I forget his name, but he's now really famous. I think he does he own Breitbart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's the owner of Breitbart and all those other um, news sites. Uh, he sort of set up this sting where he went in and basically coerced or whatever, got these organ organizers to agreed to set up uh, like brothels for underage prostitutes and he got the whole thing on video and there was a lot of controversy about like if they the videos were edited to make them like look bad and stuff like that um but basically that's how he got really famous and then from then on like breitbart and the rest of the sites they just have these really unethical tactics that they sort of just brag about they're like yeah you know we push hot buttons um i mean basically to summarize what they openly say is like, we have people we want to take the, take down, we take them down however we can. Right, we take them down using bits of information pulled out of context to tell some story that it inflames people's uh, ideas. In this case, the idea that a, um, you know, an, a, an agency, a, a, a non-governmental agency like ACORN, which is supposed to be about providing housing to poor people would actually be supporting an illegal activity like prostitution. That's like such an outrageous claim that it just grabbed a lot of attention. Yeah, so we'll do any, we'll manipulate information to take someone down. Nice. Okay, so let me hear from the Shirley Sherrod team. That was a case that happened in 2010. First, give me the who, what, where, when, and why, according to the video you watched, and then can you make any connections to alt-right demagoguery and fake news. I can say about the who and who and what who and who is the Shirley Sharonda. 
And what is they have um, no evidence uh, for this? And where is the United States Agriculture Department? When is 2010? And why? And we have a we have a trouble in figure out. <laughs> ah, okay. Why you had trouble figuring out? Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Maybe That's somebody good. in your team can yeah can say the reason clearly. Um. So Shirley Sherrod was um, made a speech and then was pretty much wrongly fired for things that she said that were like the other case taken out of context by Andrew Breitbart um, and his statements that he made about Shirley. And um, we kind of talked about um, how there was m misinformation going around and the fake news about Shirley and her statements made and how they were taken completely out of context. And then once they were re-reviewed, um, you know, all these people came out saying, yeah, we'll take responsibility for it. It was our mistake. It was wrongfully fired her. Right. So somehow the wrong information that was manipulated out of context, it, it caught fire. People took action based on that. The Obama administration took uh, action based on that. And then the truth was much slower to be revealed right to recontextualize and to realize she wasn't being racist at all she opposite of that right um but by the time the correct the corrected story came out the damage to her career and reputation had already been done in the shirley sherrod story you also get a very impassioned anderson cooper right as the journalist saying this is fucked up, right? So he's just not being a neutral reporter, is he? He's upset about it because this guy's business is trying to find the truth and he's going after that. So I think part of the reason why I wanted to show and talk about these clips was exactly what Mira said. I wanted to make sure that we understood that the conversation about fake news is not something that just started with the Trump election, okay? It's like been happening for a while now right it's been happening for a while now and these two uh cases from the early 2010 29 help us understand that um understanding how to manipulate um public opinion through um decontextualized snippets organized to make a thrilling but inaccurate story um it, it uh, people have had a chance to really perfect this technique uh which is a shame uh but it's not something that is coming out of left field completely um okay so now i'm i think i'm sharing my screen with you i hope you can see my screen i'm gonna just uh I'm just gonna do one more uh, little activity here. Um, I, want to, um, I want to talk about a couple of these ideas. So um, I wonder, can you define the terms disinformation, partisanship, political polarization, demagogue, fake news, hoax, and enclave effect, alt-right, echo chamber, or conspiracy theorist. Anybody want to take a stab at trying to explain or explain those terms? Pick one of those terms and explain it in your own words. I'm going to put those up on the screen. I'm going to ask everybody to pick one, pick one, and see if you can explain it in your own words. We're looking at that first uh, question right there. Which pick one and. Explain it in your own words. Who's first? Go, Kayla. Uh, yeah, go. Um, disinformation, I would say, is false or misleading information that isn't necessarily always true. Yep, and disinformation is is 
intentionally used to deceive people and usually in the context of some kind of war or conflict. So when we use the term disinformation, we're talking about what you do to your enemy, right? You fuck with your enemy, right? You manipulate your enemy. You give them false information in order to gain a strategic advantage. So the word disinformation is really tied to warfare and conflict, right? Uh, maybe Apple will use disinformation in order to get a leg up on Microsoft, for example. So it could be business conflict. It could be Russian will uh, send out disinformation to uh, uh, trick people uh, in the Eastern European countries about uh, what's going on in the Ukraine, right? Uh, so, but disinformation is... Like you said, misleading information, inaccurate information that's intentionally used to deceive people, usually as part of some kind of strategic advantage. Good. What's the next definition you want to tackle? Who's going to do the next one? I can do the fake news one. Excellent. I think this one is easy for me. I think fake news is news that is wrong, that is not true, that is uh, trying to mislead people into something else instead of the truth. So that is uh, my understanding about it. So there are a lot of fake news. So, so we should be able to, uh, to look at the news critically and trying to find what is going on behind that fake news. Right. We, we understand that the term fake news has risen only recently, right? Mm -hmm. And that it actually is a term like an umbrella used to describe a m multiple different types of uh, problems, right? Mm -hmm. So parody and satire have been called fake news. Hoaxes have been called fake news. Errors in journalism have been called fake news. Uh, partisanship has been called fake news. Disinformation has been called fake news. Fake news is kind of an umbrella term used to describe a lot of different messages in the environment that are deceptive. But it, it, it itself is the, the term. Um, the term is kind of like a, it's a big concept that maybe hides some more. Um, some more complicated things underneath it. Okay, who's going to pick the next term? We're defining terms here. Hi, but welcome back, Matt. I'm sharing Sorry. my screen. We're glad you're Sorry. back. Sorry. Sorry. My phone died. Oh, what a pity. But that's okay. You're somehow back. Take a look at this list. We're trying to, in our own words, define these terms. We've done disinformation and fake news. Now I'm hoping I can get some folks to see if you can explain these other terms in your own words. Try partisanship. Yeah, talk, talk me through. As, assuming it, you're referring in the political mm -hmm. spectrum, um, it's essentially your, it's either your official or unofficial support or affiliation with a specific party, or it could even just be with a cause or like a group. You you just it's your. It's like a nicer way of saying you have a bias, basically. <laughs> and that's why it's like nonpartisan, like the people that have to like play nice and like mediate shit and like, um, uh, but yeah, that's how I generally understand it. I think that's pretty spot on. And my, and my experience uh, here in Israel is that um, where, where I'm seeing partisanship is that if you are Zionist, you are pro-Israel, go in Israel. And if you are a Palestinian, you are go the Palestinian territories and we are victims. And the news from these different points of view is like, it's completely different news. The headlines are different. The information is different. The interpretation is different. So partisanship is the way ideas and information are filtered through a world view. Right. Well, it's interesting too that it's like as global. Like, fake news is like a global issue, but it's. Yeah. If I think of it, a lot of times it's concentrated in in the U.S. But it's a global issue yeah. indeed. I liked your point, Amir, um, that it, that it's a partisan is just a fancy word to call, for saying bias, right? But it does have this idea that maybe 
there's a certain kind of coherence to partisanship, right? Like it is a worldview. So stuff fits together. And actually, that means we need, we need that. We need information to be made coherent. And partisanship helps reduce the complexity of information to make it make sense, right? So there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, all right, so we'll do two more. Let's see if you guys can actually um, pick two more of these crazy words. I'm putting them up on the screen. I'd love to hear from you, Dre. Pick one of these words and talk me through it. Kaylin, Matt. Um, I could try to talk about political polarization. Thanks. How do you say um, that in your own words? I guess to me, it's just like the divide between two extremes. Um, I think um, there's people that are like extremely left, like and extremely right. And just like the difference of it and when they like butt heads and give different opinions is um, just really it's what separates people and divides people. And I think in this election specifically, even though these two are like videos that we were talking about were kind of older, are still relevant, like that people are very much one or the other. And it's kind of hard to see how we can come together and make decisions about things when we're so opposite, we're so polarized. Mm. Nicely put. And indeed, the um, complicated reality we're experiencing today is because that polarization is inflecting every part of life or many parts of life, right? So, so happy to see you guys make, uh, make some, um, uh, make some sense of these readings in relation to these concepts. I'll, I will invite you to take a look at these other questions that you should be able to answer after having read this week's reading. How does partisan bias fuel fake news? How can demo demagogues support democracy? How can they weaken it? Should Facebook filter fake news to suppress its visibility. Why or why not? When people say the alt-right is a collective experiment, what do they mean? And when people say all publicity is good publicity, what are the potential short-term and long-term impacts of this claim? These issues are all uh, identified very clearly in the readings, and I think um, that have these questions have real implications for our political situation today. Okay, so I'm gonna take a few minutes now, we have about eight minutes left, to talk to you about what I'd like you to work on for next week. Um, next week we have a fascinating topic. Our topic is terrorism as propaganda. And uh, again, a highly relevant topic uh, to really make sense of uh, contemporary, contemporary propaganda. So uh, here's, what I, here's what I'd like you to do for next week. So these are activities that I'd like you to complete before next Thursday. First of all, I want you to read each other's work. So read one of the completed LEAP3 projects of your peers. That means read the academic paper they wrote and look at their infographic and give them some warm and cool feedback by tweeting a piece of warm feedback and a piece of cool feedback, communicating publicly and directly to them via Twitter and using the COM416 hashtag. So um, this is really a chance for you to take a look at each other's work and learn from each other. Because you know, I have a saying, everybody learns from everybody. And for that to happen, you have to look at each other's work. Uh, second thing I'd like you to do is watch this interesting short video called How a British PR Firm Helps Shape the War on Terror. And you're going to use the video ant to comment on what you learned. Uh, so you've been doing a great job of that so far this semester. This is a really fascinating, this is just seven minute video, but a really fascinating video about uh, military propaganda and its uh, impact on public opinion. So what I'd like you to do this time is actually generate questions that emerge as you view. Then, 
this week we're reading a whole bunch of things. These are all short articles. So I'd like you to read all of these, all four of these articles. And as you work, these are up on the cami uh, for Chrome. I'd like you to summarize, analyze, and comment. And then I'd also like you to respond to the margin comments of a peer. So you're gonna actually kind of begin to reply to each other's comments. So I'd like a comment thread in a lot of online courses, we're gonna try using some comment threads with, within the PDF annotation. The articles are fascinating. Why ISIS propaganda works, ISIS is using the media against itself, the challenge of jihadi cool, and a tool to delete beheading videos before they even appear online. Oh my God, these, these topics are so cool. Now, finally, so you, you get what you do, right? You compose comments and then you respond to the comment of a peer. The last thing that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to play at least three units of the Don't Be a Puppet. It's an interactive created by the FBI. The FBI has um, created like an interactive multimedia that answers these questions. What is violent extremism? Who are the known violent extremist groups? Why do, who do violent extremists affect? Why do people become violent extremists? How do violent extremists make contact and where to get help? So you wanna interact through that website and then take a screenshot of your work. You know how to do that on a Mac, it's Control Shift F, I think on a um, PC it's got a F, something f4 or f5 take a screenshot and then put your comment about the interactive up on the don't be a puppet padlet wall right so i'd like you to think a little critically about what the goal of this interactive is what its core messages are and then how you respond to it um now i will invite you this week to read Leap 4. Your Leap 4 is your final project for this class. I'll ask you this week to read the um, specifications of the assignment, and next week we will talk more about it. So I think um, this week is a good week for you to see about making those connections between fake news propaganda and the alt-right and this topic we're tackling a global issue of global propaganda global propaganda in relation to terrorism um, leap four gives you a lot of freedom to explore topics of special interest to you um, but it also asks you to synthesize and it also asks you to create in multimedia forms so take some time to read over leap four start to get some ideas about what you might want to do for your final leap for, which is called create to learn, right? And next week I'll answer all of your questions about leap four. All right, so we've spent a whole hour with the amazing students of COM of uh, 416 Propaganda at the University of Rhode Island at the Harrington School of Communication and Media. I'm Renee Hobbs. I'm here in Israel. I'm going to be here for through the weekend. Um, I'm going to be on the lookout for terrorism propaganda because that's our subject for next week. All right. Uh, so let's see. We need a sign, a hand sign. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking it's the pointing at your forehead because that's the sign. So we're pointing, we're pointing, we're pointing at our signs because oh my god my head is exploding we'll see you guys next week bye bye so much fucking work